My father was Dave Ford. He was an electrician, and he spent most of his working life at the pulp and paper mill in Powell River, BC for about 35 years. I could not imagine my dad doing anything else. He loved electricity. It, he said electricity fascinated him. He was also very health and safety conscious. My brothers and I, as university students, we got jobs at the mill in the summer, and he would actually, he would actually come and find us and, you know, make sure you had the right hearing protection and make sure that, you know, everything that you were doing was, was being done safely. My dad retired in his early 60s, and I think he believed that he had a few decades uh, of enjoyable retirement ahead of him. And, you know, a few years into his retirement, uh, he, he became ill. And then one day he was walking up a ramp, and he simply couldn't catch his breath, and he had to be rushed to the hospital. Asbestos was used really in the developed world ever since the start of the 20th century. And BC was not inconsistent with Europe and North America. It was used in insulation for piping, boilers, industrial machinery. And then going into the mid 20th century, it started being used for uh, fireproofing for buildings, sprayed insulation. And then more latterly, after the 1950s and 60s, it was being used for building finishes, things like drywall, floor tile. You could make any process that was strengthening, water resisting, heat resisting, sound resisting, fire resisting, better by applying asbestos. The evidence is out there that in the mid 40s and as early as 1947, there was good evidence that those that mined asbestos had conditions similar to coal miners and black lung. The condition was asbestosis, so it was identical to silicosis. And that information was suppressed by occupational physicians within corporations that were mining asbestos fibers. Asbestos has been mined right across the country and in BC in several locations. The one most notably is Cassiar. And Cassiar was a mining town that was built and existed in order to mine asbestos. So there is a real legacy, and it's not just in Cassiar for the miners, it's also the people that work in industry throughout BC that, that work in areas where asbestos building materials are used. Asbestos improves in many ways the industrial equipment that makes the countless products we use daily. So prior to 1978, it was a free-for-all. Use it any way you want. When I started in the early 70s uh, in one of the petroleum plants up in northern British Columbia, I was openly working with asbestos dressed the way I am right now. I mean, other than a hard hat and a pair of gloves. No respiratory protection, uh, no coveralls, no containment, none of that stuff. So building trades workers, construction workers, millwrights, engineers, or just production workers who happen to be around the material are exposed. They did take him to the hospital and they found he had fluid on his lung and they drained the fluid to relieve the pressure and they sent a sample off for, for testing. and. It was the results of that test that confirmed that he actually was very ill and he had mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is a cancer caused by exposure to asbestos. The lining of the lung, it fills with fluid and as, you, uh, as there's more pressure on the lung, you can't breathe and there's no cure for mesothelioma. Dr. Selikoff was the best one to put the link together. He took 2,000 workers across North America and did chest x-rays. Followed those people for a five-year period, took a look at all of the death reports that were issued that he could secure through our organization from around North America, and looked at the cause of death. He put together a paper that was penned in the mid-70s. 
He concluded that the asbestos workers were 10 times likelier to suffer from asbestos lung disease than the general background population, which in turn prompted the US EPA to ban the application of asbestos in US, US buildings. And then other uh, developed countries followed suit with similar legislation around that time. And that is the basis for the change of regulations in North America. Uh, of asbestos because it identified the hazard, it identified the diseases, and it identified mortality rates. So the direct link between exposure and death was done as a result of that. The people who were exposed over the years and who now are at particularly great risk because they're 25, 30, 35 years from when they began work, these people are not being kept under surveillance, they're not seeing doctors regularly, at least we could save some of them, and we're not. Uh, we're sort of transfixed by this tragedy, and as a country, we're not handling it very well. And it became news across the country, across the continent, and around the world. So then it was obvious to any activist in the trade union movement about the problem. The step was then, what do you do about it? 1978, when we saw the introduction of new regulations that talked about Section 35 on asbestos and how to clean it up and how to control it, it was a pivotal piece of regulatory change that industry had something that they had to pay attention to. The enforcement by the regulator, then called the Workers' Compensation Board, really started in earnest in the early 1980s. But what hadn't been fully quantified was what about the thousands of buildings that have asbestos in place? How do we deal with that? How do we manage that? Do we clean them up right away? Do we scale the risk? How do we notify parents, patients, occupants that they may be in a dangerous workplace? And so it really, really was, a, it was a time of really understanding the risk and prioritizing the risk so we dealt with stuff that was dangerous appropriately. In early 1980, the regulations with respect to asbestos were very general in nature and weren't providing the degree of control or protection that the board had decided needed to be in place. And so the board put together a standard practice manual for taking asbestos out of work sites. It was a change from using exposure limits or speed limits to actually looking at the physical condition of the asbestos um, and its likelihood of being damaged. To learn that what he was dying from was a, a workplace exposure, it was devastating at the time, but when we started thinking about how important, or how much precaution he took at work to stay safe, if somebody had just told him to be careful and, and what the precautions were, he would have done it. In 1998, the uh, new Occupational Health and Safety Regulation put in much more prescriptive demands for employers to manage asbestos proactively. They had a requirement to do uh, risk assessments and hazard assessments of the asbestos in place in the buildings to a very defined set of criteria and think about and articulate the routes of exposure to the worker and how that was being controlled. The heaviest consumption of asbestos in BC was in the mid-1970s in terms of tonnage. And so you'll see on a graph, you know, this is where it peaked and then it started to go down. And then you'll see 20 years later, the number of people developing and suffering from asbestos-related diseases is increasing almost exponentially. It has contaminated our environment and it has led to increasing numbers of asbestos-related diseases. We're talking about cancer primarily mesothelioma being the medical term for that, but there's also lung cancers, gastrointestinal, uterine, head and neck, and so on that are in lower numbers. You add all that together and do the arithmetic, it's about 500 people a year, BC. My dad had always said he didn't want to die in a hospital room. He wanted to be at home. So we told him that we were calling the doctor to come. And so the doctor came and a nurse came and, and they said, it really would be best if he were in, in the hospital. And so we told him we're all coming and that we'd be there to decide. You know, stubborn, he was still there and we lived through the night and into the next day and it's not the way you want somebody to go and, you know, he said he had more left to do in life. He had every expectation of a sort of a long, healthy retirement. So it was hard. My dad died 
on October 18, 2008. He had turned 70 a few months before. The legacy of asbestos is fraught with loss. There's been unnecessary deaths as a result of this, and that is gonna continue for a period of time to come. People here think, oh well, you know, it's okay, that's an old problem from the 60s and the 50s and the 40s. It's, it's a current problem, still. The tragic legacy of asbestos was that manufacturers for self-interest, shareholder interest, continued applying and selling something they knew was dangerous long after, long after they should have. And the people that suffered from that weren't the shareholders, weren't the, really the directors of those companies that made those decisions, it was the workers. The next asbestos hazard is certainly in front of us somewhere, so we should find out what it is and make sure that it doesn't take as many lives as it has in the past.